events, um, critical sections. I mean, all typical synchronization primitives that can be used in order to properly synchronize processes as well as, as files. So, my task now is to give you a fast knowledge, a fast and compact knowledge of how to create, run processes and threads. I will be back on that to cover some more details. Okay? So, last time, so this is a review of what I did last week. I basically talked about how to create a process and essentially you have a function with a long list of parameters. We'll talk about that. Please notice that the executable that you can call essentially of or what to do is covered by two parameters that are called here long pointer long pointer lp means far pointer. I mean this is something related to the Intel or Intel uh, architecture and near and far pointers. So it, it just means a pointer. So LP here is, stands for a synonym of either pointer. So pointer to image name, it is a pointer to a string. LP C T uh, uh, S T R means pointer to a constant, so cannot change it constant string in the T version, which means, depending on what you choose, Unicom or not, this can be either a standard character string, char string, or wide character string. So, the T means it will be either one or the other, depending on how you compile and how, of course, you run this program. Okay, so this is, which means when create process, you don't mind about enveloping and embedding the string in underscore capital T and then parentheses. It is automatic. So create process, depending on how you compile your program, accept either it's a Unicode string or a standard string. Again, depending on the options you have. Now. You have two strings. First is image name, and second is command line. A command line is a long pointer to a string, not a, point, a constant string. Which means, if you have one executable file and two arguments, that are the extra options that you put on the command line in order to call something, an executable, for example, uh, that can be cp, copy, a.txt in b.txt. You have one executable name, first option, first argument, second argument actually is um, a.txt and b.txt is the second. You have a flexibility. You either choose image name as the name of the executable and the extra arguments, the true arguments, uh, in the command line, or just the command line. So, and basically you will see this in, in examples, in given examples. But there is a flexibility. Wherever you see Windows functions, think about they have to be flexible since they, for historical reasons, they cover old versions and new versions of software and of choices made. Uh, about that. So here we have two ways. This is it. And then something, and we have seen an example of process creation without going into the details. Then the single thing that I mostly, mostly covered was how can we wait for termination? How can we terminate the process and how can we wait for termination, which means wait for single objects and wait for multiple objects. And we didn't cover all. We didn't cover everything. I just told you this is how it is done, and I showed you an example that was grab the multiprocess, in which the idea was I have a main process that receive, receives a list 
of file names. For each of them, it is going to create a process to search in that file, collecting results of mul on multiple output files, and gathering the result and printing the results. Today, we'll see the same task done with threads instead of processes. Okay? But before starting, let's go to threads and talk about threads. So, this means I will come again on the slides on processes and review and explain the parts that I have intentionally left uncovered. Okay? So, we go to threads and please notice that for what concerns threads, I will essentially cover the, the starting part, go to thread creation, thread function, an example, thread termination, exit code, an example again, wait for thread termination, that is the equivalent of how we wait for thread for uh, process termination, that is same, wait for single, wait for multiple objects, and then something on C library. Go into synchronization object, what is called here 2, the second part of this chapter. This is what Professor Quare will explain you in another set of slides. So this is the redundant part. I have intentionally left it here since it is covered in given chapters on threads. But this is something we not do, not explain, even though I left in my slides. It will be covered from, let's say, within one hour and, uh, and a little more, by Professor Quare. So this is where you are going to talk about what it is called, essentially, events, semaphore, mutex with different shuffle order and something more. Okay, so I will just cover half, the first half of, of the slides on um, uh, threads. My slides are essentially the original slides from the author art where I have moved from the blue background to the white background. Simply because it depends on how, how the, the room is uh, it uh, better dark and, and uh, I mean dark or, or, uh, or uh, white is better. Okay, so just to show you where we are. So let's start now with threads. And when explaining threads, let's go to what are threads? So this is the same slide and the same picture that we have been showing to introduce processes in the sense that processes are the complement of threads and threads are the complement of processes or threads are part of a process. So, a process is characterized by, from here up, everything that is single for the process and different from two processes. Here we see what is characteristic of a single thread. A single thread. I guess that you are supposed to already know what processes and threads are. You have been doing that extensively in a Unix Linux environment. Now we are basically seeing the same things, probably you know, even a little more, uh, well, simpler in terms of theory, maybe uh, a little complication that you can find is in how parameters are passed and so on. But essentially they are the same thing. So what is a thread? What a thread is? Is an execution entity within a process that is characterized essentially by, by having a stack, a program counter, the current extraction, and slightly more, and sharing whatever is global data and also the program with other threads. Sharing code, sharing the program, doesn't mean that all threads necessarily execute the same thing. So whenever you generate a thread, you know that if you are the software engineer, the programmer, you are expected to develop a function. So you may add a program where 10 threads are executing the same function 
Or you may have a program where four threads are one executing A, one B, one C, and one D. If you plan to run concurrent things by processes, in Linux, you are expected to write something like fork here, fork there, and then add sort of open close. This is what the child is doing, this is what the parent is doing, and probably both of them sooner or later are calling function A or function B. In Windows, as we have seen, we don't have fork. So we are essentially expecting that whenever you generate, create a process, you execute an executable file. Nothing prevents you from generating two processes that are executing the same executable file because you want to do that uh, thing a few times in parallel. Grab, for instance. Okay? Nothing prevents executing the same executable of the father. Nothing prevents. You should distinguish them if you are the father or, or the client or, or the child, maybe by a proper argument on the command line. But it is not so good. Typically, the reason underneath calling another executable is the task of the father is written here, the task of the child is written there. The true reason for the fork command in Linux is efficiency. The child and the father, as soon as the child has been generated, basically share everything. So it is a matter of efficiency in memory management. So this is the reason. They are doing almost the same thing. As soon as the child is created, it already shares everything, and so it is quick. Generation of a child is quick. Generation of a child by create process means loading a file into memory, an executable file into memory. But this is essentially. In a thread based concurrent programming, what are you expected to do as a software engineer? You are expected to write a program, single file program in which you write the function for the main thread, maybe, and the functions for the children threads or the other threads. Or maybe you write a file for the main thread, the file for the second thread, the file for the other thread, but then you link all of them together in the same executable. So it depends if you are producing an executable for, from a single .c of, or from multiple .c in standard and professional or relatively uh, um, usual not too small programs you are expected to write many, well more than one dot C and link them together. Now, we are here. So, the thread is something that is basically characterized by its own stack and its stack point. In Windows, threads, well, Windows was an operating system that, that was planned and created with threads as main execution entities. So it is a thread based um, operating system. Now, well, I suppose that you have seen many uh, graphs representing sequences and many kind of synchronization stuff with threads. I'm simply here showing an example, a motivating example, uh, for why concurrency. So here it is saying this. Suppose you have two tasks to be done, and these two tasks are independent each other. Read file A, maybe read and put data in, an array, in the first array, <coughs> read file B, read the file and put data in, the se in a second array of data. So, two operations fully independent. Instead of doing that, then merge data means once you collected data from first file in array A, data from second file in array B, do some stuff, do some job. Which means put them together, sort them, do so if they are integer data, do some collection and manipulation, I don't know what, but 
This is task A, task B. Independent, once both of them have been done, do something on data. Well, I guess you may understand that we could do the, the two reads in parallel, in concurrency, by essentially starting with threads. Well, you have the alternative of one of the tasks can be done by the current thread and so generating just another one, but it's a matter of understanding what we prefer. When we do this stuff, typically, we generate as many threads as are the, 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 the parallel tasks to be done because it is easier. Otherwise, you should write the component of the parent threads and the component of the child thread. So here, the, the, main, uh, the model could be main thread generates two subthreads and waits for the termination of that, doing nothing. Okay? And then wait and then merge data from both files. This is a motivating example. Here you can put either, well, barriers are something that essentially is important if the threads need simply to synchronize and then resume and doing other concurrent stuff. Here is enough to let the threads terminate and then just wait for all of them. So no particular synchronization is required. So this is a simple scheme in which essentially we say we don't have data sharing problems with the exception of not putting data from one file and the other together in the same locations. Of course, if you put data in a single list in a strictly sequential order, you are mixing the things up and you need, and you need some synchronization. If you do the job of one array and another array, you are safe. No synchronization, no semaphores. This is the best. Typically, if you want to really exploit the power of concurrency, you should. First of all, think, can I do the job without semaphores, without sharing nothing, any kind of data? Because this is good. They can run independent. Okay, so this is the, the, the framework. In order to do that, we can see how we create a thread, how do we uh, specify what functions, uh, what function needs to be done, and how we terminate and wait for the thread. Okay. Yes? In, in your example, uh, Tell me. Two, uh, two, uh, two parts uh, have the same address? Has, no. I mean. Uh, yes, uh, I mean, the two, what? Well, I, I expect. What? Well, they can be different. Maybe there is a file containing certain data with a given format and another file containing other data with a different format. I'm supposed to write two different functions. So read A, read B, and so one thread will, will execute uh, read A and another, another thread will execute read B. Or they simply are two files containing C, maybe um, a list of students on one file and a list of students on another file, so it will execute the same function but duplicated in two execution threads. So it, it depends on the application. Okay? So, uh, how do we create a thread? Okay, how do we create a thread? First, we need to specify the thread start address lp start address lp thread start routine so this long name is nothing but a type def to a proper function pointer now i know that function pointers or pointer to functions are not probably the, the stuff where you have been most experienced in the past, but this is not the first time that you have to, to handle uh, pointers to functions. I think that both in the first part of the course and in other part of the courses, you already have kit against pointers to functions. It means, so, if you think that an array, when you see char v square brackets 100, v is the name of the array. Well, 
you should know it is also a pointer to the first slot in the array. So when you see function sort, q sort, printf, uh, whatever, read here, the name of a function is also a pointer to the beginning of the function in memory. So whatever <coughs> is here a pointer to a function, and believe me, this is a pointer to a function, it means that you are expected to put here a name of a function. When calling create thread, you are expected to put here my thread, where well, my thread is the name of a given function. Same as how you create a, a threads in, uh, in the Unix, Linux, POSIX, so on and so forth. Now, let me go back. Okay, first specify the function, then specify the stack size. So here, double word, count bytes stack. So it means that you're expected to tell here, either I trust default, and I put here zero, nothing. I accept the default stack size, or especially if you're planning to use some recursive function that you're expected to generate recursively many stack frames, you could modify the stack size. For, let me say, for standard, not too aggressive uh, functions with not big data structures, you don't care about that. You could maybe change, increase stack size if you know that your thread is going to manipulate and uh, handle big data structures. Or a, re a recursive behavior with a, a, a high recursion depth. Okay? So, this is where you put the stack size. Pointer to argument for the thread which is here, long, long pointer to thread parameter. It means that the routine is the classical thread routine. Unfortunately, the language does not support put here any kind of, I mean, a routine with an arbitrary um, signature with an arbitrary prop type, which means I need two parameters, put there two parameters. I need three parameters for the thread routine, put here a name of a function with three parameters. Because if you call here a function with three parameters, you are expected to list the parameters somewhere else. Calling create thread basically means the following. Please, operating system, create, uh, create thread. Generate the thread, and then this is the function to be executed. This, these are the parameters for that function. If you allow full flexibility, this would mean this is an arbitrary function, this is a set of parameters, one, two, three, or the given type. I don't care. This is complex in terms of support for this kind of thread creation. Well, the choice is the following, a little worse for the programmer, a little better for the operating system. Create thread, this is the function, it has to be a function with one parameter, with one parameter, stop, a pointer. I want to pass three, three things to that function, pack them together in a C structure. So, and give me the pointer to the structure. This is what it, it, it is done. I just need one parameter, it is a pointer, good. I already accept the pointer. It is an integer, well, we can use a trick. It is a pointer, but the pointer is able to hold an integer as well. Put me an integer and we mask the integer as a pointer. It works, it can work, sometimes. Or, put the integer some, somewhere and give me the pointer to that integer. Who is going to interpret that protocol? The function that I'm writing 
when the function is called. So I'm the responsible for everything. Create thread is just doing intermediate work. Creating the thread, which means generating an executable stream of instruction, calling the function and passing one pointer to that function. I'm responsible for writing the function and if I know that the pointer is pointing to three, th uh, three integer float string packed within a C structure, I'm responsible upon starting the thread function for reading and packing everything needed. Okay, so this is the reason why most threads, uh, most thread based functions start in the same way. Declare something and cast from what void pointer to something else. Let's see examples. So this is creating a thread. So let's see now the first example that is the equivalent of the other grep multiprocess. Please take a look at the grep, uh, grep multiprocess that we have seen last week. <laughs> Essentially we have oh, sorry. Essentially, we have seen that this function was a T main, a T main that was generating at some point creating file, creating processes for a given amount of iteration, and then waiting for those processes to end and then stop. So this file grab multiprocess is just starting processes. The trick here, from the standpoint of the programmer, is what are processes doing? Processes are basically doing this. Command line and command line command line is doing grab which is, this is the executable, first argument, string, second argument, quoted, so that you can include the double quote <coughs> in, the, in the command line, allows you to put, if you want, blanks here. So you can have five names with blanks. But this is grep, uh, oh, five name, and what, what to put, uh, sorry, grep, search string, and five name. Rv of 1, Rv of i. The search string is common, the file name depends on the process. So this is the task done by the process. It means that somewhere else you need to look for grep. Which means I'm expected, sorry, I'm expected to read grep.c. Grep.c is the executable that is called, and in grep.c you are expected to have open file, search string, and whatever, because it is using regular expression, something like that, pattern match. It is doing some sort of pattern matching task in a file. It is simply reading a file, and complex or not, you may like or not, but it is a C based string processing stuff that is essentially checking if the current line in the file matches or not whatever I'm searching. It depends on the rule of searching that I'm implementing. But this is a file containing string manipulation stuff. Whereas the other file is containing process generation and process result output stuff. Uh, there are other processes that are called uh, basically doing cat, which means print the result. But the essence of this is I have three files, one file that is my main process, that is detaching processes doing grep and detaching processes doing cat. If we go to the multi-threaded variant, grep multi-threaded, you see a T main. In the T main, basically, at a certain point, 
you have four instead of having I cross, you have I thread, which is understandable. So, but the equation is the same. RC minus 2. If you want 10 files, RC must be 12. Okay, for a certain amount of times, which means example for 10 times, do grab on a given file. But in order to do that, now, we just see that we have to start a thread. Now, believe me, begin thread X is an equivalent for a creative thread. I will explain you why you use begin thread X and not uh, thread create, create thread. But this is creating a thread. And the thread is created not with an argument, but with th grep. So, the function to be executed is not here another executable that is doing string manipulation. It is a function within this program that is doing uh, string manipulation. If I already had grep implemented, I'm pretty much likely to copy and paste some of the instructions there here in thgrep. So for instance, let's look at this function. thgrep is a function where if you look inside you see pattern match, you see search string, pattern match, pattern string, this function pattern match here is something that is in this file as well. Here, it is something pretty much similar to what we had here. The pattern grab. The grab is the other uh, uh, function here. In grab, we see this function pattern match that has been copied and paste uh, around the two files or two files. So what I'm telling you is, if you go multi-threaded. You are expected to put everything in the same executable. If you go multiprocess, at least in Windows, you are expected to write a program that is doing the main task and different executables that are doing the child or the uh, process tasks. Okay, so let me go back to multithreaded. So, great multithreaded. Let's go to the beginning again. So, once you have created threads to do the thread task, th prep, here you simply detach and then you collect the handles of threads. Like you have the handles of processes for waiting, here you have an array of handles to threads. So it is pretty much similar. What are you expecting from generating 10 processes? You obtain an array of 10 pointers, of 10, 10 handles to processes collected in an, in an array of handles. Here you have an array of handles to threads. What, can I, what should they do on those handles? Once you have finished detaching the threads, you are expected to wait for that. Here, it is doing the following. Different from last time. And this is a, a bit tricky. For while, this is a for or while event. While thread count greater than zero. Which means, let's use numbers. Suppose arc C is 12, then thread count is 10, which means I just have detached 10 threads. All of them are running. Wait for multiple objects means I'm waiting for 10 threads. The handles are here in this array. Please, false. On the other time it was true. I'm not interested to all of them to finish, please wake me up or release me when at least one of them has finished. Which means, why should I ask, uh, sh sorry, why should I wait for all of them to finish before start 
starting printing the results? Well, it can be the Y can have a multiple answer. I really should wait for all of them if the print order is fixed. If I am detaching 10 threads, but I want first of all to print out the result of thread number 0, then thread number 2, then thread number 3, what I'm expected to do here is wait for thread number 0. Just one, wait for single object, print the result of thread number 0. Here it is uh, telling you another story. Each of them is good. Anyone ending, please react. Do something on the result of that trend. So, here you see the following. Wait for multiple objects. Sorry. Wait for multiple objects. Thread count, 10. Thread handles, false. Not for all of them. Infinite just means that you, don't, you want to wait until at least one of them uh, completes. Now, wait for multiple object is returning you an index, which there's no mystery here. It is basically telling you who, which among the 10 threads has finished. So, it is basically telling you thread number 5, thread number 9, thread 0, thread 2. Uh, but to make things a little more complex than you expect, thread number 0 will not be called 0 and thread number 5 will not be called 5. They will be number starting at this value, weight object 0. I don't remember if it is 32, 64 or something. But this is a number and so suppose this is 32 it means that thread number 0 will be number 32, thread number 1 will be number 33, and so on and so forth. Which means that the actual thread number, I thread, of the thread that completed will be thread index, the one obtained, minus weight object 0. This is the protocol. Why that? As all protocols, as all laws, ask the one who decided that. So, there is a reason, probably. Because some lower numbers should be interpreted in a different way. Okay, so, here, the protocol is the following. Wait for multiple objects with false is releasing you as soon as at least one of the threads as completed, and it is indicating you which one with a number that if you want to normalize that number to the interval 0 to number of threads minus 1, you should subtract weight object 0. This is the rule, not too difficult, but it is understandable. Once the, this thread has been completed, if this number is invalid, it means that there is an error. So you are expected here to have a number starting from 0 to 9 included or 10 excluded if the numbers were the one that I have indicated. Okay? <coughs> then, the thread completed, it could have completed for an error. So, get the exit code thread, it is basically obtaining here a potential exit code if the thread has generated an exit code error or standard. Once the, uh, this has been done, the handle that you obtained by, uh, by thread creation, by begin thread x, is not valuable, not uh, necessary anymore. So you can close the handle. Just remember that closing the handle of something 
means in Windows closing the usage of a given data structure. Uh, the, head, the thread has already completed the data structure where you can observe something is still alive. So the thread has finished, but you can obtain a uh, guaranteed code from the handle. Which means that a process or a thread can finish, so disappear from the execution point of view, it has terminated. You still have a data structure accessible through a handle to observe how it completed. Okay? When you close, it means that you release the data structure. Okay? From your standpoint. Okay, so it means, example, thread number five has completed. Here I obtain the exit code. Not enough. If exit code equals zero, it, it means that's okay. No error. It works. Now, uh, print the file name. So, tprintf uh, arguments of ithread. I mean, print the name of, the, of this file. <laughs> Where the um, um, where the result have, have been uh, put. Then cat, which means print the file. Uh, so this was the file to search, and this is the file argument of three where uh, the results have been put. We didn't go to the details right now. We don't know where, but. And we just are understanding that after completing the grep, knowing that the result of the grep, so the, the lines that match, have been written in a given file, here we print the file where we have searched and the file where the results have been put. We didn't uh, um, observe and we didn't comment the data structure so far. So, printing this command here. And here creating a process. So it is still exp exploiting process creation, at least for printing. So essentially, here the variation from the, the, the other program was there in the grep multiprocess, there was there were 10 processes doing grep and 10 processes doing cat print. Here we have 10 threads doing grep and 10 processes doing cat. So printing is not uh, done concurrently, but it, do, is, it is done serially by processes. So this is equivalent create process to the, for those of you who know the system call in, uh, in C4, for instance. I'm simply creating a process to do cat, name of the file, for simplicity. So, the protocol is the following. As soon as a thread is completed, we go here. If the thread termination tells me no error, I'm simply printing a proper com preparing a proper command line and executing that command line as a process. All right? So, I know that uh, thread number five has written the result in a file whose name is in this array dot trb of so it is here then after creating the process it is waiting for the process okay so once a thread has terminated immediately it is printing the result and waiting for the printing of the result completed so that we don't mix up stuff. After that, close handle of the process and close handle of the uh, thread of that process. Please, just a remark. When we generate a thread, we just have one handle to the thread. When we create a process, we have two handles for that process. A handle to the process and a handle to the thread. And thread creation, we see 
For head creation, here it is. Uh, they get relaxed. It is. The index is returning a handle. If you see T handle I thread. So thread creation is returning a handle, which is put basically in an array of handles. Process creation, so create process, is not returning a handle, but it is returning a Boolean result. Okay. I could create the process, I could not create the process. Whereas the handle are put, there are two handles as a result. The handle to the process and the handle to the main thread of that process that are put here in process info. And whenever we want to close the data structure that we have for that process, the process is completed. Here we close handle process info dot age process and age thread, which means handle to the process, handle to the thread. All right. So the idea is basically whenever a thread or a process has completed, sooner or later we are expected to close the handle or the two handles. Now we also are expected here to delete the file since it was a temporary file. We delete the file, and then something that is always tricky, not all of you understand, and it's pretty much good to put in some exam question. Which means, now, uh, try to understand what I'm doing. Uh, we had 10 threads. Thread number 5 completed. We have reacted and done the job for thread number 5. If we loop and wait again on the same array of 10 handles for one thread to complete, thread number 5, if thread number 5 is uh, again there in the data structure, the handle of thread number 5 would say, I am a completed thread. So, if you wait again and thread number 5 is not closed, it is still there, it means that you still wait for 1 among 10 terminated and that thread has already terminated. So, the risk is if you leave thread number 5 behind thread number 5 there, here it would be, uh, uh, it would be a, a problem since we already have closed uh, thread number 5. But, it is the pointer to something that would always tell, I have finished, I am finished, I am done. So we need to remove thread number 5 and next wait will be on the other 9. How do we remove one thread? And so there are two ways to remove one in a, in a given array. Pick the, the slot that has been, need to be removed and shift the, the resting one of one position left. Or, if you don't care about the order, if you don't care about the order, remove, take the last one and put it there. It depends. Depending on what you are planning to do, you can either pick the last one and uh, re replace there or shift or try to do something else. Here, it is doing the following. T handle of I thread number 5 equal T handle of 9. Take the last, the last thread and put it in slot number 5. Then, basically, it is not enough because thread number 9 now will be called number 5. If you put its handle here, wait for multiple objects, suppose this thread will uh, uh, terminate, will tell you number 5. So you would say again number 5. No, it was thread number 9 that is now called number, number 5. So, it is, easy, it is one of the classical things that are conceptually easy but tricky. And we have two ways to handle this stuff. 
where is the problem? The problem is that we have something else that has been labeled number 0, 1, 2, 3, that are the names of the files to be printed, and maybe something else. How can we rename something that was number 9 to number 5? Two ways. Everything that was number 9 now becomes number 5. This is this solution. So, we take whatever. There is a data structure that is an array of structures containing arrays. It is complex, but everything that was I threads, um, all the number 5, will be replaced by what was 9. So we took whatever in my data structure had number 9 and we move it to number 5 and we decrement the number of threads. We say they were 10, now they are 9. And then there would be 8, and then there would be 7, and so on and so forth. There is another strategy, a little more tricky, that is a double indexing. We just have an array of handles, and we have an array for remapping. So we leave everything here, but we use another array. I'm not going into detail right now. But we should have something to tell the new number 5 was number 9. And so, in another array, at position 5, we should simply put 9. And so leave everything else at position, original position 9. This is tricky, but it has to do on the fact that are running threads using something that was at position 9? If yes, you take care about not moving something that is currently used by running threads. This is the discriminator. I, I mean, the general idea is, unfortunately, if you want the luxury of waiting and reacting whatever is terminating, you need to flexibly uh, adapt yourself to the just terminated thread. As always, in synchronization, if you want simple synchronization, sometimes you use time. If you want more aggressive and more efficient synchronization, it means that the synchronization scheme are going to be more um, uh, flexible but also more difficult to implement. So this is the general scheme. So for now, take the idea that the general scheme for waiting multiple times. So next iteration, we will wait for nine. First of them to finish, example number two will be completed. We will print the result of number two and move data from thread eight to the two slot. It will become the next two, and so on and so forth. Sooner or later, no more thread to complete. And so it means we first wait for one among ten, then one among nine, eight, seven, and so on and so forth. This is the true way of waiting. Not the only scheme, there are other schemes to do the same job. You simply need to think about this fact. We need an array where, continuously, we have the handles to whatever we are waiting for, and as a result, I will be told where is the pointer that the handle to the thread that has completed. Up to me, adapt the data structure. Not always easy, not always so clean. Alright? So this is what we are expected to do. Now, this is this end. Just to show you, there is a way that the thread function is called, and so we have the intradex here. So, Thread grab here is called with a second with a first parameter that is n g arguments of i thread. So for each thread you are expected to pass that function a pointer depending on the kind of strategy that you follow. This is a pointer that is, has to be meaningful for that particular thread and possibly having no uh, sharing 
mutual exclusion problems with other friends. One pretty much standard way of preparing parameters for threads is having an array of C structures where each thread is going to have its own or its own slot in the array and so no mutual exclusion problems. It means that thread number zero is going to read and be right in the slot zero of a given array. Thread number one is going to use slot one of, of a given array. No mutual exclusion problem. Mutual exclusion is important when you are accessing the same variable, the same counter, or the same variable, red or five or whatever. So we don't need semaphores here. Because we have 10 threads, we prepared, let me go to G arguments and show you that G arg is malloc, so dynamic array of grep thread arguments, size of this. So we are allocating an array of 10 arg c minus 2 structures and this grep thread argument is a structure where we have a number and we have uh, four strings. Four strings in which we are essentially replicating whatever was in the other side, multiprocess, passed to the grep command on the, on the file, on the process. So, we see that in this G argument, for each thread, suppose thread number zero, thread number one, thread number two, in this structure, we are filling argv of zero is not used. Argv of the defect, argv or one, we are copying the actual argv one, argv i. If you remember, grep multiprocess was basically generating processes and passing each process the name of the grep executable and then the pattern and the name of the file to search. This is going to be the pattern, this will be the, uh, uh, the file to search. We omit number one, simply because we want argument rv of one to be in slot number one of the array. We still have one extra parameter to give to the uh, thread the function, that is where to put the results of grepping. With processes, we exploited the, the ability to change the standard output of the given process to be created. Here we cannot modify the standard output because it is the same standard output of, of the main thread. We are in, in a given process. So we pass here, we take a temporary file name. Remember I told you, you could play with file name one, two, three, four with arbitrary name, but getting temporary file name guarantees that these are unique file names within the file system. Get this file name, and then uh, put this file name uh, here in this string. The file name, the file will be opened by the thread instead of being opened by the user <coughs> file. It will be passed as a third argument. So essentially, you see that we have a then argument kind equal four. So it is passing parameters. To the thread, single parameter pointer to a structure, in which we have sort of embedded parameters that are mimicking, uh, that are doing things in the same way as if they were a process. So the, the set of parameters is parallel to the set of arguments that we would pass to the, to the uh, process. Not the only way, basically we know that. The only thing to be known by 
the thread are three strings. There is the file name to be searched, there is the string to be searched, and there is the file name to be for the output. These are the three things that, that are required. Okay, so this is where uh, how it works. And if you look at function, begin for the X, it is here. If you look at function thread, you see that thread, generic function, is the following p grab arguments essentially is a pointer to void. This is a pointer. Now, what is done here is argc. So this pointer, p args, this pointer is typically. Oh well, in, in this case, this pointer is uh, immediately cast here. So you might know that you see cast from void pointer to something else it can be explicit or implicit, it doesn't matter. So here we are directly putting here as argument to the function something that is PR, PGR args is a pointer to the grab argument. It's a pointer to a structure this way. So, the thread function is receiving a pointer. Okay, it is receiving a pointer that is internally cast to a pointer to a data structure. Once we have that, it is manipulating the three or but only three are meaningful. Uh, one of them is the pattern, one is the file to be searched for, and the other is the um, is the second is the file to write. It is essentially using a data structure that is argc arg argv here, simply to be enabled to copy and paste something that was originally written for a main. So this function is from here on working on argv123 same as it was a main program. It means the author first implemented the multiprocess version and then he copied pasted uh, this program here. So you will see that here there is a uh, uh, file open rc minus one. I mean, it is equivalent to the original program. So, up to you to, to take it. Now, going to that, I will skip here the going to the I will skip here further explanation. I will just come back a little bit on thread creation, just to show you <coughs> that the thread function is a function that is expected to receive a void pointer. And sooner or later, either to have an exit thread or return exit code. This is one of the two ways to terminate. If you want to terminate the thread, and this is the code that is that can be obtained but get the exit code. So there are examples that we will consider, but we already have seen an example. Uh, essentially, there is create thread, and then somewhere a uh, close handle on the handle obtained. Here we have a main that is simply creating one thread, so not an array of threads, simply one thread, and you're closing the thread. Um, here there is sort of a very pragmatic and not so beautiful way of waiting for the thread because here the main is simply waiting for uh, somebody to write a queue which means the, uh, the operator, the one who is looking at the program at, at a certain point is going to press a key to say N so there is no real synchronization with the with the thread that has been detached. Okay, so it is very trivial. 
not the best way to do. We miss here the weight simply because weight from multiple is going to be explained later. So this is how you create a thread, not yet weight. Now, uh, thread termination is, as always, implicit thread termination if the process exits. So if you destroy the, pro the, the process, all threads within the process will, will terminate. Better to exit thread, and exit thread means with, uh, there is a different as terminate threads. All thread support provide you a function for suicide exit thread. So I have terminated and so I'm finishing, I'm ending my job. Or, this is more killing, terminate thread, which means terminate another thread, not suggested, simply because you basically are stopping something that is in the middle of operations, typically. So, not suggested, to be taken for extreme cases, when you know that the system is, or the program is uh, probably not in a good state. Okay? Close handle is not stopping, ex this is stopping execution. Stop handle means closing the data structure that's, that is tracking the state of the, the, of the thread and can be observed if you want to get the exit state. Okay, so this is, there are two things. Um, starting, creating, terminating a thread or exiting from the point of view of the thread, but then the one who has the handle should close the handle. Get exit code is to obtain the uh, end of execution code, and then a thread is characterized also by, the, by a thread ID. We will talk about that. Both for threads and processes, they have also IDs, which means in Windows you have a process as well as a thread that are mainly characterized by a handle. So handle is number one way in order to work on a given data structure, on a given, given kernel object. But sometimes the pointer is not beautiful, not good if you want to show something. They also have an ID, a number. Number is much better if you want, for example, to look at the printout or something like that. So, they also have a number and ways to pass from one to the other. Not important right now. I don't want to talk to of thread suspension will come in, in a later in the next lesson on Thursday. Wait for multiple, wait for single, same as processes. We'll talk about that. Let me talk about now, not time out, talk about that. Uh, let's talk about C and well, the internet. So let me also say that for certain reasons. This is something that is at least partially old style. This book and this set of information are probably a few years old. And depending on where, uh, when you are working, probably the most recent support for Win32 Visual Studio and so on and so forth will probably be better than what is blamed here. So here it is basically telling you the following story. Create thread is good, but beware of something. There are a few, not too many, but a few uh, C library items that are critical to create thread. So C library is not thread safe in the sense that the C library has some few global variables. Um, I guess you know the error number constant, error no. That is something that can be observed after a, 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 a normal, abnormal exit. It is simply tracking a number that encodes a given error and you can pass this number to a given function in order to, to print something. 
but I don't know, is a global variable. If you are in a perfect random environment, it could happen that Arnaud is set by a thread and maybe observed by another thread as well as they are mixing up. If they are both randomly <coughs> in some way, uh, this is a, a shared variable. Other global variables, there are in C um, some string manipulation functions, string talk, for example, where you call that function once, it will search a substring in a given string. You call that function a second time, it will search in the same string, not from the beginning, but resuming where it left the, the, the previous time. So, it is a function that is state sensitive. It means, I'm a thread, I'm the only exclusive user of string talk. I plan to search a substring of a given long string and want to find the three instances. For example, Italy is written three times in a given long string. I want to string I want to search and, and have the first, the second, and the third, third pointer to the eye of Italy. What does it happen if two threads concurrently are calling string talk on different strings? It means that they are mixing things up. And beware, it would not be enough to use a semaphore. A semaphore, a mutex, is good when intentionally you want to share something, in this case the variable, that the pointer that tells you where uh, in the string you are. Intentionally you want to share something and you want to exchange information among different threads. The only reason why you do, why you exploit the semaphore is that you don't want to write concurrently. You want to have race conditions, something else, but you plan to share. Here, when you search in a string, you want to have exclusive use of that string. You don't want to share the variable that remembers where you are in the string to be shared by another thread. So two of them have the bad pointers. What you want is each thread have its own global variables, variables sorry, that remembers where to restart. Each thread want to have its own exclusive error number, error node variable. You want two error node, three, one for each thread which is not provided by the standard C library that was planned uh, for basically single core, single process execution. Not threaded. Now, it is not true anymore. As far as I read in the Microsoft MSDN or Microsoft Doc, they said that essentially the C library that, C, that they use is thread safe. But this, historically, is the reason why they told you, you have to call begin thread x. Begin thread x is essentially defined that internally is using create thread after doing some manipulation on data structure. Basically preparing some local global data structure for threads. Exploiting thread local storage and stuff like that. But we are not going to the details. From the standpoint of the programmer, the rule is simply the following. Do you want to have thread safe usage of the C library? Please call me with the with the underscore. If you don't care because you know that you're not using C library functions that are thread, thread critical, you can use create thread. And probably nowadays you can you can use thread, uh, create thread uh, anyway. Okay, so this is the reason. It has simply to do with the fact that like you see t printf or underscore t something, you have names that are, maybe you would better uh, uh, like underscore create thread or underscore t create thread. It, it has been called that this way. Because some programmer in Microsoft decided that this was the name. Okay, so this is how it works. So I guess 
for now it is uh, good for me. Oh, okay. With begin thread x, you have the end thread x instead of exit thread. So you close with the, with the symmetric um, name of the closing function. It is simple to explain to you that you have slides saying create the thread and then you see the example with the difference. It is an equivalent, basically doing the same job. Simply every name. Okay? So, enough for me today. Now we make a break and then Professor Fair will keep on with the semaphore.